Good afternoon and welcome to the first CS 526 seminar, serious seminar of the semester. Uh, I'm Gene Spafford and I'm doing the intro to the course today. The instructor for this course for this semester, Professor Maji of CS, uh, is out of the country so he can't do it today. I'm standing in for him. Um, if you haven't participated in these before, let me just give you for those of you in the room who are enrolled in the class, a little bit of background. Uh, this is a four credit course that you can sign up for. If you have signed up for this course, uh, each week you need to sign in on the sign-in sheet which is circulating in the room and uh, record that you're here. Uh, the class is a pass-fail class. It's based on your attendance. If you miss more than two of the uh, presentations, then uh, you'll need to do a makeup, and Professor Maji is the one who will uh, provide that. Uh, for the course itself, we're going to have a variety of speakers this semester, as with every semester, and uh, you get to listen to their presentation. At the end of the presentation, if they're willing to take questions or during the presentation take questions, uh, you need to turn on the microphone in front of you at the table, and you do that by pressing the little button until the green light goes on. That's not so that the presenter can hear you, but so that we can capture your question on the video. These are recorded and then made available through iTunes, through YouTube, and on the Sirius website, so you can go back and look at these later, should you wish. And there are many people who view the seminar remotely, and to those people, welcome also. We're glad to have you listening in. Uh, let me ask that if you're in the room, please turn your cell phones off or mute the ringer uh, during the presentation as a courtesy to the guest. And I'll use that as a segue. Um, our guest today is Michael Taylor. He is the chief software developer at Rook Consulting. Rook is a uh, major uh, software and security vendor here in Indiana. Uh, is a partner with Sirius and does a lot of work, well not just in Indiana actually, it's, it's throughout uh, the country and beyond, but they're based here in Indiana and in Indianapolis and they do a lot of work in development of, of software in response and consulting and uh, Michael has been their lead developer for a number of years and he's going to talk to us today about uh, methods for developing secure and perhaps insecure software. So, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, Michael Taylor. So, uh, just a little bit of background on uh, me and what we do at Rook Security. So, we're a managed security service provider. So, we uh, basically monitor and walk the perimeter of our clients' networks looking for intrusions and um, the signs of compromise within uh, the client's environments. Uh, I was brought in about three years ago uh, because as we were growing, it was, uh, the need was uh, identified that we needed to better integrate with the various uh, deployments within our, so our client's environment. So some clients would have, um, say, Palo Alto firewalls, uh, other ones would have SonicWall, other ones would have uh, one set of uh, SIM solution, and we needed a way to uh, better integrate and automate that process and so uh, we started the development team uh, about three years ago and um, we've since uh, deployed our tools uh, in fortune 100 fortune 500 um, uh, clients everywhere from china to india uh, as well as uh, locally um, so um, I did my uh, undergrad at uh, wgu i also teach uh, secure code at the 1150 academy that's uh, uh, down in Indianapolis. They focus on uh, app development and um, kind of uh, job transition seekers to uh, get people from zero to being able to program uh, fairly quickly. I enjoy D&D, &D, um, other board games, uh, online video games, as I'm sure many of you do. Um, so the, the general um, focus for this is going to be the, uh, the patterns that we see in uh, secure development and the, the practices that we've seen to be successful in uh, development environments, the, the things that um, 
we've identified as uh, yielding net positives uh, for uh, those teams. And then the things that are um, seen to be net negatives, uh, things that uh, the anti-patterns, uh, the things that uh, companies repeatedly do thinking that they're going to have a, a good outcome, but in fact they have a, a terrible outcome in many cases. So um, the, just from the top, the security by design is often uh, something that is neglected. At the beginning of the, um, the requirements gathering, not planning your, uh, your project in a secure manner, not um, I d uh, spending the, the cycles at the beginning to ensure that the way you're going to implement your solution it, from the, you know, the bare wire to the graphical user interface is uh, designed securely. And then uh, looking at those um, aspects, both in the development of the code as well as in the deployment of that code, whether it's um, you know, on a mobile device or um, you know, up in the cloud. Uh, security training is another aspect that uh, we like to focus on. Uh, one, one of the issues that we see with uh, a lot of the um, interviewees that we uh, look at is that they often haven't either had security training uh, within their undergrad or that it came so late in their career that they've developed bad habits in the way they approach code and the way they think about code. And so whether it's um, failure to uh, address uh, input sanitization as a you know, a, as a default uh, kind of practice, or whether it's um, looking at um, the the way that they uh, design their their classes and their architecture, uh, that that's something that um, is kind of a, a bad habit that we like to try to break with the uh, secure training that we provide. Um, and then, uh, employee awareness: uh, most of the breaches that you, you've heard about, uh, everywhere from Target to Home Depot and Jimmy John's are, often have a social engineering component. Uh, so looking at how uh, to ensure that your end users and your employees are uh, being trained and the, the way to um, approach security is just as important as uh, ensuring that your code is secure. And then uh, just to revisit the uh, solid principles of development, the uh, for object-oriented development is usually a a, a good refresher since, um, you know, just like with the uh, uh, re revisiting the, the best practices to ensure that you're kind of truing up with what you're currently doing and how um, we've seen the, uh, the best way to, to do that. Oops. And then the, the anti-patterns, uh, you know, the, these are certainly not uh, all encompassing. These are just uh, a few that I uh, chose to address. Uh, th these are things that we've seen in deployments um, when we do our pen testing as well as um, our um, uh, code review that we've seen in companies everywhere from, you know, the, the startups to Fortune 100 uh, companies where they are, um, have not invested uh, to pay off the technical debt and to ensuring that they have uh, followed the best practices. And so um, they, they can be called anti-patterns, uh, also code smells, like your fish has gone bad, your code smells. Um, so, um, so it's not a matter of uh, if your application is going to be attacked, it's really a matter of when these days. Um, whether you are just getting uh, you know, a drive-by from somebody who sees your application out on the web and they decide to try and pop it, or you're uh, a victim of a targeted attack, um, it really is um, if the, the case where if you have a service out on the internet, somebody is going to see it and somebody is going to attempt to pop it either uh, through the uh, programmatic uh, methods using like Metasploit or uh, Nessus or something along those lines, or if they perceive that you have something high value uh, and then really investing the time to go after it. Uh, some of the, uh, the trends in, in that space is the transition from attacking credit card companies or companies who hold credit card data to uh, the um, healthcare industry because the healthcare records are much more rich in the information about the individual that they have 
And so instead of just having a, a credit card uh, entry, they can uh, do loan applications and um, a variety of other uh, financial instruments that, based on that data that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do just from uh, getting the credit card information. So security by design. You want to make sure that the way you're designing your system is not just accidentally uh, preventing an, uh, an, an attacker from being able to get into your system, but that you are intentionally designing your system securely in a manner that will um, not only address the, the current known uh, attacks that uh, you have identified, but uh, allow you to address future ones uh, and be flexible enough that you can uh, do that without incurring a significant amount of um, resources being spent to, to do that. So uh, when, when you're selecting your, uh, the way you're going to architect your system, you know, looking at what, whether you want to use an open source operating system versus a, a closed source operating system, whether you want to use something like um, uh, Amazon's uh, Lambda processing, stream processing, instead of having to host your own operating systems to, to run your code. Uh, those are considerations to, uh, to take into account. Um, one, one of the things that we see uh, as well during our uh, code analysis is um, that not um, the, the considerations and the libraries that are used and imported whether they are uh, third party or built in house or open source, they're making sure that you're going to be able to rely on those libraries now and in the future to be supported is important. And what, making the decision as to whether um, for your use case, is it appropriate to use an open source library or is it the, um, the better choice to use uh, to redevelop it in house uh, so that you can uh, ensure the appropriate maintenance of that library. And, uh, you know, with, within the development world, as I mentioned, um, it's not always the code that's being attacked. A lot of times it can be uh, other components from social engineering to your network. And so your code may be secure, but if your network is not, then all the, uh, you know, sanitization and error checking is not going to prevent your system from being compromised. So uh, it's, we found that it's been beneficial for developers to have some basic understandings of uh, the operating system and the networks and things like that, so that they can uh, be a more uh, contribute more to the team at, during the design decisions and uh, troubleshoot their own problems and understand how their application is actually being uh, built and uh, and deployed without being uh, kind of constrained to their IDE where they're siloed off and just the code, it's, be, it's better, in our opinion, that they uh, have a, a more well-rounded knowledge of, of how the system is put together. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> excuse me. So Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon's uh, uh, com capability maturity model uh, integration um, defines a series of security regions where you can make these decisions. Um, so from the security process area to the development process, uh, the products and solutions, and process assets, this workflow helps to ensure that you're um, at, at each stage of your decision-making process that you are um, preparing yourself for a, a secure solution. So the, um, and this also ensures that you're able to uh, continue to follow the, um, the various uh, regulatory bodies um, guidelines. So everything from the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to the PCI D DSS uh, for your credit cards to HIPAA, um, designing your system to, uh, to have these decision-making gates in place uh, allows your team to uh, continue to, to um, develop securely. So here, here is the uh, workflow from uh, Carnegie Mellon. And so it, from the top down, you can see you're, um, you're looking at your organizational preparedness for your software development. So uh, how well is your current um, 
network and op, uh, infrastructure design? Have, do you have your, your virtual private cloud um, implemented in, in such a manner that you can segment off from your publicly facing to your development environment to your staging and QA, uh, your security management uh, and projects. So are you investing the appropriate amount of resources in uh, designing and testing uh, your systems, uh, your requirements and uh, tech technical solutions, uh, ensuring that your system is, um, or your design process is including uh, security as a component. One of the, the major downfalls we see is security being not a, a value add to a system. Uh, security can often be dropped as unnecessary in favor of uh, focusing on features. And if your management team is not buying into security and they say, you know, give me two features instead of uh, implementing security appropriately, that can be a problem. Uh, so I'm not going to focus too, too much more on this, uh, but this is, you know, an example of how uh, organizationally it's important to um, establish security as a, um, an integral part of the way your development team and your network team and your operations team plan to implement uh, security within your uh, platform and in the future as you uh, deploy it to your clients. Um, so uh, some of the other criteria that you need to look at is how are you managing your source? You know, uh, do all of your developers have um, you know, read-write to your repositories? Do you have the appropriate segmentation uh, within your uh, projects? The risk being you have a developer leave your organization, they had read to all of your repositories, now perhaps your, um, your um, information and your code is out in the wild. Uh, what deployment tools are you using? So how are you getting your code from uh, Git or Bitbucket or SVN and out and onto your servers? Uh, are you uh, storing keys out in your servers that might be compromised to later access your code? Um, those types of design decisions have to be made at a higher level than just within your code base. You have to choose the tools that allow you to do that type of uh, process. You have to make sure that those tools uh, integrate with the environment that you're uh, planning to deploy onto. Uh, your continuous uh, integration system is also important. Being able to um, identify bugs within your system and quickly address them and push patches is uh, highly important. Uh, you remember the uh, heart bleed or shell shock bugs that we've seen in the past. Um, being able to identify that you're vulnerable to to that um, uh, to that library and then uh, quickly mitigate and then patch as the um, those become available was uh, an important step for many companies who are who are vulnerable vulnerable to that to not being compromised and because. Um, you know, it's very easily easy to identify somebody's running Apache, they're running Apache on a Linux server, and therefore they're vulnerable to, to this and uh, an attacker try to um, pop them. Uh, your unit tests and uh, code coverage, that's another thing that can often be dropped by the wayside during your application development. Um, the, with the um, reasoning being management wants more features. Manage management will want um, you know, the next revision to be released and the things like uh, code coverage or unit testing are often seen as extraneous. And if you don't enforce uh, strong uh, compliance to your, um, your company's uh, security uh, policies and processes, then those uh, can be neglected and then you have a greater and greater technical debt that you'll eventually have to either address or um, uh, pay off in some manner um, when, when you get to it. Uh, penetration testing and, uh, and the static code analysis is another component. Uh, getting third party eyes on your code uh, outs from outside developers is a really useful thing to finding and identifying um, the, the ways in which your, your code is potentially vulnerable. Um, 
you know, never trust your users, you know, whether it's uh, a cat walking across your keyboard or somebody maliciously trying to attack your system. It uh, can often take somebody from uh, who wasn't deep in the design to identify the way that your system might be broken. Uh, network segmentation, you know, is, is also a, a key component. You don't want your developers working in production. It always ends in tears. And so, you know, as much as your developers might want to be able to say, well, there's just a problem out in production, I'll, I'll do a quick, you know, bug fix. Following your appropriate uh, code uh, deployment uh, procedures will ensure that your uh, production environment doesn't uh, stray out of alignment with the appropriate configuration that you've established for that environment. And then having your, uh, your staging and quality assurance environments also segmented so that your development data and uh, staging data, you know, testing data doesn't get pushed into uh, production and that those systems aren't a vector of attack against your client and production data. You don't want somebody coming into a potentially insecure development box and being able to uh, use that as a jump host into your uh, production environment. Uh, so employee training is, uh, in my mind, almost as important as uh, development training. Your you know, secretary or HR resource that has access to uh, everybody's uh, records, um, especially the financial suite, We've seen um, CFOs and uh, vice presidents of finance be targeted for wire fraud transfers uh, fairly frequently. And that's because executives are, um, you know, a target rich environment from an attacker's perspective. It takes a relatively low level of effort to attack them um, because it, typically it's a spear phishing campaign where they've identified the bank that uh, a company may use they uh, create a fraudulent email to uh, address uh, a CFO or a SVP of finance. They say, you know, wire transfer me, you know, $20,000, it's a Tuesday. The, uh, the executive expecting a series of wire transfer re requests, they click the button and the money's gone. And this is because the executives don't have, typically have the same uh, expertise with security as, uh, other members of the company and they're also more prone to break the rules because they are executives and they have fewer people to report to. So they're uh, particularly prone to, to that type of attack. Um, password management policies, uh, you know, no, nobody likes changing their password. Nobody likes having to remember highly complex passwords. Um, but there are uh, tools uh, these days that can make that much easier. Things like uh, LastPass or KeePass um, allow you to uh, programmatically change your passwords, generate highly complex and excuse me, secure passwords, um, as well as um, being able to access them uh, remotely so you're not having to keep a, a password database with you. And then uh, applying those policies from a a corporate level is um, one way to uh, ensure that you know you're not having people you know have a post-it note with their master password right on their their laptop. Other things like uh, Ubi keys to uh, add a salt to your password. So you might have a relatively simple password like you know baseball horses, but then your Ubi key uh, allows you to inject a, a complex series of additional characters to that password um, each time you need to enter it can allow you to uh, heighten uh, your password complexity without having to uh, increase the difficulty at remembering it. Um, the social engineering awareness, one of the things that we do uh, is uh, physical uh, testing. This is where we go on site and we see uh, how far into a corporate environment can we get uh, before somebody stops us and what can we do there. So, you know, it's usually just a polo and a clipboard and we, you know, it, I'm Michael from your uh, IT servicing company. I need to go check your network closet. And many times they will let us right in without having any kind of scheduled 
uh, appointment, and then it's, uh, oh, well, I'm in your network closet, and it looks like I need uh, a password to uh, reset your, uh, your email access. Oh, okay. Well, I've already let you in the door. You're already in the network closet. Go for it. And so having your employees have uh, the appropriate amount of training is really important. Because like I said, it doesn't matter if you deployed your code securely. It doesn't matter if you wrote your code securely. If you have an attacker physically present in your network closet, it's essentially game over at that point. They can install pony boxes. They can install uh, network sniffers. They can hard reset your firewalls. It, the, the number of vectors of attack that they have, once they have a physical presence in your environment, is essentially unlimited. And so. That, that first person at the door, whether it's a secretary or um, you know, the, whoever's controlling entry, is, is just as important as your application developer or network architect. Um, and that kind of transitions to the bring your, your, own, your own device um, situation where people are bringing in uh, their own cell phones, bringing in their own laptops to work. Well, um, it, as I'm sure you've seen, Cell phones are a great vector to get at personally identifiable information and passwords. You install uh, Candy Crush Saga 2.0 and they decide to uh, release that into malware. There have been um, now uh, libraries allowing you to root uh, a phone through the updates. And so now Candy Crush has rooted your phone and it's listening to the passwords that uh, your phone's sending to Gmail or um, whatever other services that you're connected to on the corporate network. And um, that's a, you know, yet another vector of attack. Um, and uh, uh, if you're using your corporate laptop, for example, on your home network, if your home network's insecure, that, that can also be uh, a way attackers can target you. So if you're um, you know, bringing your corporate laptop, logging into your corporate email, <coughs> And your, uh, you know, your public, your advertising, your uh, your home Wi-Fi with default passwords and uh, default SSIDs. It's relatively easy to attack you from uh, from that vector. So some relatively easy training uh, from an employee standpoint can go a long way into protecting your uh, your PI and uh, PII data. So. Uh, any questions thus far about anything that I've covered? No? All right. So uh, solid principles. So solid design principles uh, are object-oriented um, uh, ideas that we um, have found uh, it's important to, to include when you're uh, writing your code as well as when you're designing it. And so just briefly, uh, single responsibility principle, the uh, open-close principle, uh, Liskov uh, substitution, uh, inter interface segregation, and dependency inversion. And so the, the reason these are important to security and not just design is it allows you to ensure that when you're developing in an object-oriented environment, that if you follow these principles that you're not exposing yourself inadvertently to vectors of attack. And each of these principles helps to uh, encourage you to develop securely, whether um, they're, it's intentionally uh, secure or not. It, it makes your code uh, more modular. It allows you to have uh, lower technical debt when you're extending your code. And it also um, allows you to extend and um, your development process more quickly. Um, like I mentioned, uh, having some network fundamentals within your development team so that as you're developing, if you, a service is unavailable, your developer's not uh, at the, not beholden to the network team to tell you, well, that server's down. You know, having some, you know, basic understanding of how to get to uh, how to identify what ports a, uh, an external server is listening to, how to identify whether your, um, your SSL uh, keys are um, uh, valid or not for the service that you're trying to get to, and things like that can uh, limit the, uh, the downtime of a de developer as they're working because they can 
uh, be their own help desk rather than relying on um, an external team. And then uh, following the, the least privilege uh, model. So if we go back to the uh, Heartbleed attack, if, you're, um, if your Apache server is running as root, or uh, Shellshock rather, if your Apache server is running as root, if you pop Apache, all of a sudden you have root on that box rather than if you were running as a limited service account, then you're exposed uh, much less than, uh, than you might otherwise be. And then, uh, you know, there are many other uh, different design principles, you know, everything from uh, continue edu continuing education to uh, stress testing and load balancing. One of the interesting things that we've seen as uh, cloud deployments have become more popular is stress testing a system to the point where it starts to fail over or add resources can change the uh, t topology and attack surface of a system. And so if you can force it to fail over to its, um, to its non-standard state, you can expose uh, systems that are more vulnerable than the one that you were attacking initially. Um, so uh, the single responsibility uh, principle, classes uh, should have only one reason to change. Now this is important uh, because a class should have only a business uh, principle behind it for, um, for its change. It shouldn't be uh, changing at the um, behest of uh, anything outside of that uh, single principle. So uh, a great example is the, uh, the engine in your car. So to, to most of us, when we turn on our car, we don't care whether it's a V8 or it's a, an electric engine or whatever. We just care that it's powering our wheels. But to a mechanic who's trying to service your engine, it's going to be greatly important as to whether it's a, a Nissan V6 or a, a Toyota a V8 and what the individual components are. And so under, understanding that um, the only reason that uh, you're, in, from the user's perspective, that that engine should change uh, is uh, for, for your perspective. So the mechanic has a different use case than, than the end user. Um, and so, you know, why not have just a single purpose for your objects would be uh, you would end up with not uh, a one-to-one -one relationship between objects and methods. And that would be uh, not an ideal uh, situation because of, you know, code overhead and uh, design uh, cumbersomeness. Uh, so the open-close principle. Uh, so objects should be... Uh, open for extension, but closed for modification. And so if, I like the shape example here, so if I had a, a shape object and I needed to calculate the area of a shape, it would be better for me to have within the shape a method to um, return the area instead of me inferring that this shape's a square, so then I will get the, um, the area by multiplying the shape side by the shape side, and this, this area is a circle, and I'll multiply it by uh, pi times the radius squared. It would be, it, this allows you to um, extend that class much more easily than you might otherwise uh, do. Uh, Liskov uh, substitution principle. Uh, so uh, return to the shape example. You know, all, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. So um, if you had a, the rectangle be the parent of the square object, you can run into issues where you're trying to set the uh, side of a square object and you're having to overwrite, um, to overwrite your methods to ensure that for the square object, both sides are being set rather than setting the, you know, say, uh, width and height individually. And so if you do that, you'll violate the, this particular principle. And so it's better to implement the generalized shaped object um, with its own area method rather than um, using the, uh, uh, that inheritance for the rectangle. Uh, and so uh, interface segregation. Uh, clients should not be forced to create methods that they don't use. Uh, we see this in uh, uh, a lot of our front-end development where 
if you're trying to use a login method, um, sometimes uh, certain frameworks will make you follow a series of steps that aren't necessary to, say, just to display a, uh, a web portal rather than um, allowing you to segment a login page to a uh, table of contents, uh, et cetera. So uh, you shouldn't force an object to implement uh, methods that aren't necessary. And you know, the, shape, oop, the shape analogy you know, comes back to haunt us where um, if we have a square object, we shouldn't force it to have a volume method where, because you know, it's a 2D, um, 2D shape, there's no uh, concept of volume to that. So um, implementing a, a solid shape object which could then have the volume contract as a component would make more sense in this uh, scenario. Uh, dependency inversion. So I enjoy this quote from uh, Derek. So high level modules should not uh, depend on lower level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Abstractions should not depend on details. Details should uh, depend on abstractions. And so essentially what he's saying is um, to correctly bind your system together, it's um, important to uh, not depend on the, the details of the higher level abstractions and not the other way around. Um, so the, the, this has the, to do with the idea of coupling and uh, how tightly coupled your system is together. Uh, so an example here, uh, if you have an API that's implemented for a web application, the consumer shouldn't know if I decide to change it entirely from being written in .NET to written in Python. You know, I, I should be able to, as long as what you're receiving from me uh, from a API perspective remains the same, as long as you're receiving the, the same data structure, it shouldn't matter to the consumer. Um, Network fundamentals, we mentioned a little bit uh, in helping uh, the developers uh, not only troubleshoot their, their own code, but to, um, to allow them to contribute uh, more to the uh, design and architecture of the, um, the projects that, that they're working on. And having that uh, more generalized um, knowledge of the way systems work and, and ensuring that they, they understand how the components tie together can um, you know, not only uh, give them a, a better ability to contribute, but a better ability to, um, to troubleshoot their, their own problems. So you know, problems that I've seen where we've, um, we've managed uh, external development teams like in the Asia Pacific region um, where they're less well-rounded the uh, pace at which they can develop code is limited because they um, they've been un they, they don't have the network understanding that the that they need to be able to understand why they they can't reach the services that they're trying to get to or why they aren't crafting their um, SSL certificates appropriately to be validated within the um, environment that they're working with and so uh, ensuring that your developers have a general understanding of how to do these things um, really improves the productivity. Uh, least privileged design, um, you know, th this is a scenario where the, the level of access and the, the privileges that a user or service has can, um, you know, either increase or decrease the uh, risk at which you are um, presented as, as you're offering your service. So uh, making sure that you're, um, you know, everywhere from your code repositories where users should be limited in, in the number of uh, repositories that they can see to your service level accounts where your services should have a limited account running the service so that if, um, you know, if it's exposed or uh, compromised, it's not able to compromise the entire system. Um, uh, this also goes into um, the way you write your code. Your uh, procedures and your methods should have a limited scope at which they can modify and access data. Um, you know, we see this with private or protected uh, methods as well as with um, the inheritance policy of certain methods. 
and this you know helps uh, improve system stability uh, and you know allows you to deploy more easily if you have to run uh, your deployment code as root uh, every time that's often a, a sign that you're not deploying things as um, as well as you might otherwise and clearly it will help improve your uh, system security so uh, we get on into the anti-patterns and the, the code smells. So these are the things that we see that uh, people continue to uh, implement even though it is, um, it, it causes them uh, pain and, and heartache. And so Henry Spencer has uh, stated, those who do not understand the Unix platform are condemned to reinvent it, albeit poorly. Um, and we, we see this a lot uh, people need a scheduler instead of using cron D, they invent their own. People need an email system instead of using the, you know, SMTP uh, processes that are or services that are built into Unix. They they write their own to, to interface with that. Um, and not only is that bad practice because there's already uh, a service available for them to use, but now they have the additional technical debt of having to support the code that they wrote. And now they're responsible for any bugs that are in that code. They're responsible for updates and additional features instead of relying on the people who came before them and have been, you know, likely working on that particular problem set much longer than, than they have. And we see this in um, relatively inexperienced development teams. Uh, as, as the uh, team grows in maturity, the, these mistakes typically lessen, but um, they can often carry on throughout a project where a design mistake early on as the team was relatively young can uh, be persistent within that code base. And so, you know, uh, additional uh, scope and reliance on that uh, redundant system that, it, that they designed can um, often be pushed forward through, you know, multiple uh, releases. And this is, uh, you know, particularly bad practice because it's not productive. You're not you're not getting any more features into your product. Your your development team is often working outside of their field of expertise. You know, and so the you're you're making uh, uh, increasingly uh, expensive uh, mistakes. But in certain circumstances, it is important to to do it yourself if there's a library that's open source but has a, um, a particularly restrictive license, you might need to rewrite that library uh, for, for your own internal development. Uh, if, if you're not allowed to um, then resell the code or if you have to uh, follow certain attribution or uh, release uh, code, um, that might be one reason why you might rewrite an entire system, but it's a very fine line in, in making that decision. The uh, the God object, so often this starts off as a relatively um, naive object. You write a manager object that's gonna do a couple things and all of a sudden um, that object is responsible for the, the rising of the sun and the setting of the moon and you can't get away from uh, calling it in one way or another to do everything within your system. And so, you know, whether it's getting inherited uh, by everything or it's uh, carrying out more responsibilities, it's vi violating the single responsibility principle. And we see this uh, sometimes with front ends where your uh, API server is, you know, running just one massive behemoth of a code stack to return you know, a, a database interface that might otherwise be able to be implemented, you know, elegantly with a different platform, or um, you're running a, an engine that is uh, managing all the, uh, the starting and stopping of your processes. Your, um, you know, for, for back to our email example, it's, you know, reading everybody's inbox and tagging it and filtering it and, um, instead of having a, a, a set of uh, more modular, modular code. Uh, so a, a, oops. A, another example, the, the ghost object or the poltergeist object. We see this where um, 
um, more procedurally experienced uh, developers uh, become object-oriented developers, and they um, perhaps aren't ex aren't as um, knowledgeable about how to um, to to work within object-oriented design. So they might create an object that is uh, a, a, a shim in their code to to start s start up a class and set some things, and then that object goes away. And uh, th this is a problem because it introduces artificial complexity in the system, and it, it's cumbersome to, um, to maintain, as well as um, share the knowledge within your uh, development team. You, um, that knowledge transfer of, you know, I need to, to call, you know, server object init zero, and then wait, and then server object init 10 later is not at all um, object-oriented. It's, uh, it, follows a more you know, procedural design pattern. And that's, uh, it, it's not only inefficient, but it's, um, it makes it difficult for uh, the onboarding of new developers and the documentation of, of um, your code as, as you move, move forward. Uh, another one, uh, missing abstraction. So, you know, if you have, uh, say, hard-coded uh, uh, user account information or um, network information as, a, as an inheritable file that can, um, instead of having that in an object or a configuration uh, method, that this can break your deployment. You know, say, I, I deployed out in Amazon and I had a public IP and I hard-coded that public IP instead of obtaining that either from an if config or, or some other statement, now my service isn't going to work because it's expecting one IP when I'm, my server is currently existing uh, at another location. Um, this can you know, happen anywhere from you know, global variables to, um, uh, to uh, usernames and, and things like that. Um, so th this is an interesting one. So the, the over or under emphasis on, um, on security. So l like I mentioned before, security isn't a value add to, to most products. It's uh, assumed that if I'm using an email app, that it's going to be secure. If I'm using you know, Pokemon Go, it's not going to compromise my Gmail account. But in reality, you know, security is adding value because if you don't have security and you become compromised, you're company very well may go under. But the, it's an inferred uh, value. So if you uh, push it off until you know, later and later and later and, and never address it, you have an almost insurmountable amount of technical debt that you have to, you know, in, all, in one big bite, address. Or if you focus on it all uh, too much before your application is mature, you can really limit the, the growth of your application. And so it's important to be able to identify at what level of uh, maturity is your application. Do you, are you obtaining uh, client data or are you just working with your test data? And uh, you know, are you preparing to begin ingesting client data? At which point you really do need to be prepared to protect that. And so you, understanding when to emphasize it and having the appropriate decision gates at, within your development process will for, uh, ensure that you're not uh, hampering your overall um, development uh, progress. And uh, you know, often it's under emphasis, as I mentioned before, because you know, features are often seen as uh, more valuable than security. Uh, security silos. Uh, we see this uh, often in, in lar larger organizations where instead of a, a smaller uh, development or DevOps team, you have IT ops and help desk and uh, the networking team and then the developers. And so having um, an unclear uh, delegation of duties you know, as to who's responsible for the network security and who's responsible for the network architecture and then who's responsible for the code security. If that is all somewhat muddled and uh, each of those teams reports to different uh, managers, then there can be infighting and 
uh, other uh, friction within the organization that uh, creates inefficiencies. And that type of uh, friction can lead to power plays and you know people getting pushed out. Uh, another uh, uh, scenario that we see is uh, in uh, CISOs and CIOs who frequently don't last more than two years in an organization. They get golden parachutes and they move on to you know the next stepping stone. And uh, a, a common pattern is they enter an organization. They say, "Oh, I see." you've got this finite set of problems. I'm going to fix it with, uh, by purchasing XYZ piece of software. By the time that software is getting installed and implemented uh, corporate-wide, they're exiting before they even see whether that solution was the right solution or address any of the initial problems that they were brought in for. And if you have your teams be uh, being segmented, that creates even more uh, confusion as to you know, who is ultimately responsible for that decision, who's going to now carry on that, uh, that process that the now exiting C-level uh, executive is, um, has created. And that is all. Can I answer any questions or? You know, Oh, push, yeah, push your button. So this may be too hard to do block question, but when you take a look at most of the clients that you see, mm -hmm. where would you find most, would you, how would you allocate between training, uh, development, and just the normal staff in terms of vulnerabilities? Where, where do the, the vulnerabilities arise the most? Yeah, if you had to suddenly say, I'm going to try to fix them, the worst thing first, where does it most likely happen? It, I, I would say it, all, it almost has to be in training. The, um, we're, we're just looking at a, um, a response where some, some of the uh, pen testing organizations will say, if I have a 80% um, success rate with a, a phishing campaign, that means, you know, eight, it, two out of my ten employees failed my uh, to follow the best practices when reacting to a spear phishing campaign. That's a successful set of training. To to me, that that's a highly pr uh, problematic uh, metric to follow. You know, if you know, the, if if especially given that you know any t you know if you have. Uh, like a shared set of uh, network drives. Uh, that's BitLocker on those network drives. If uh, one of those two people who failed uh, was a, a HR secretary, that's you know your entire employee set of records now gone. Um, I think that the the training there in in many organizations is where the the softest component is because it it's not requiring the attackers to to find a break in your code. It's, they, they don't have to understand your, your database schema or the vulnerabilities in your API. All they have to do is manipulate the person. And I think that that is ultimately the, the most cost-effective way for an attacker to gain access to your system. And um, you know, attackers, uh, the, those groups are run like businesses, they follow the SCLC, they have managers, they have features, they, they have uh, you know, deployment strategies. So they, they are, uh, in the same way the, the privately run organizations are operated, they have you know, revenue goals and the, the cheapest way to get money is going to be the way that they're often going to try to achieve that goal. I'm sorry? Nobody else. I have uh, one question. Do you find, do you get to do kind of repeat um, inspections into, into things? And do you find, are, is, is training effective? Is it, or are there things that seem to make a big impact? Are there things that don't seem to have an, an impact? Yeah, sure. So um, we'll, we'll frequently, re, um, organizations will have um, periodic 
uh, testing that that's required from you know either PCI or HIPAA or or one one of the other um, uh, regulatory bodies requires them to to on a certain uh, time frame do this either training or testing, and what we've seen is you might do uh, spear phishing training and and say you know look at the URL from from which your email is coming before and before you click a download and ensure that you're expecting an attachment before you download it and things like that. And, you know, uh, kind of like a, an immunization, you, you, you see an improvement and then you see a fall off. And so we'll, we'll do the, the kind of an, uh, testing where, you know, immediately after the training, we see how well people are doing and then a lot of times that's announced testing where we'll say, okay, you guys just all did the training. Now we're going to do a spear phishing campaign. And so they're, they're aware of it. And then maybe a month later do an unannounced campaign. And that's typically much less, uh, the, the success rate of the campaign is much higher for the, from the attacker's perspective. So, so th there is it, it's it's incremental though it, it, it's you know it, the non technically um, adept individuals it, it, it's you know about repetition and uh, you know in the same way that you know everybody learns it, re repetition and um, you know encouragement and showing them how this improvement is, is going is protecting, you know, not only their jobs, but the, the organization's, uh, you know, profitability is how we often see that, that improvement uh, go through. But, the, you know, there's no um, silver bullet to, you know, say, you know, one magical training solution gets everybody on board or, or one um, network pen test, you know, all of a sudden has captured all of the vulnerabilities in your environment and you do a round of fixing and then the next time we come in, nothing's there. It, it, because there, there's only so many hours and, and excuse me that an organization can invest and so you know we like for the uh, network pen test we'll do one series and they fix you know maybe they fix all the criticals but then we still have you know all the highs and mediums and lows that they have to address and the those are often uh, a value judgment versus uh, you know it, it's not a uh, like saying you know a, a critical vulnerability is 32 degrees Celsius, and an, uh, a high vulnerability is you know, 40 degrees Celsius. It, it's there. It's, a, a lot of times, it's about what what is a value on that asset. Is it a development machine, or is it um, you know a, in production? Is it holding PII data, or is it not? And so, making sure that as you're running those tests, you're aware of of what's at risk. Uh, allows us to increase or decrease those thresholds. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Um, when you when you look at um, some of the software development that's going out there, are are you seeing um, software developers starting to utilize some of the the APIs that are out there for like operating systems? I mean, we've seen a lot of improvement with like you know trusted platforms, mm -hmm. hardware security, you know, enclaves, but these seem to be separate APIs that you have to use. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure people are doing better with web application development in terms of using, you know, APIs for SSL, TLS, but there's a lot of the underlining APIs, you know, that right. are you seeing a lot of that or, I mean, how's the training with that and how, is that a part of the do you see that being adopted, or so? So it, it really depends on the organization's you know core business model and uh, how as to how much that's being emphasized in their development process. Uh, GE's uh, CEO just said that every new hire uh, that they have moving forward is going to learn how to program in in one way, shape, or form, um, and we we see this. Uh, Frequently with amateur developers who are you know really you know wanting to teach themselves how to, how to code and so they're writing a, a web app and releasing it out into the store and then that's on your phone that you know is with you everywhere that you go and so this kind of um, that there's 
today there's a much wider range in the experience level and expertise of developers than I think there has ever been. You know, the, it, when, you know, even a decade ago, it, most code was written more predominantly by professionals than it is now. And so the, those security um, APIs and, and the uh, operating system uh, components that are available now are not necessarily being adopted by those amateurs who, are, who have not been exposed to security from, from the beginning of their development careers. They've been hobbyists or um, you know, tangentially exposed to, uh, to programming and, and are you know, self-taught rather than um, getting that understanding of how to develop securely from their, uh, the beginning of their career. Mr. Taylor for his presentation and discussion here. Thank you.